All right. So here we, we're going to go ahead and start talking about pyramids, right? So now much uh, mystery and, and sensationalism uh, surrounds the, the pyramids of Egypt about, well, how old they are, right? And who built them and, and their purpose, right? For instance, the Pyramid of Giza. It was considered one of the, the seven wonders of the ancient world uh, with the, the, this great pyramid the largest, the tallest, I should say, structure in the world until the, what, I think the Lincoln Cathedral was completed in 1311. Uh, so it uh, you know, rises 481 feet in the sky. Of course, uh, you know, with any mystery, right? <laughs> Many are anxious to fill in that void, maybe a little bit too anxious, uh, with various people advocating uh, everything from these structures being built uh, by ancient aliens or with their advice uh, or to being used for storing grain. Uh, so so what were they? Well, uh, as you know, um, I will explain the exact history. I mean, the exact history as we know it concerning the development of these magnificent structures and their ages and their builders and, and their meaning uh, as a trained historian, as well as an archaeologist, as well as a scholar of religion. My PhD is in all three areas. I will make sure you will leave this talk with enough information to satisfy all your inquiries. <laughs> and maybe, <laughs> hopefully, help you create new questions in their place. So, so as back as far as, as 1842, uh, that's not that far, but <laughs> a certain Carl Richard Alepsius counted approximately 67 pyramids in Egypt. But uh, many more have been discovered since then. Uh, so right now we have found around 118 so, so often we focus upon the pyramids uh, along the, the Giza Plateau, but the reality is there are pyramids all over Egypt. But, however, um, there's a few things I want to bring up, with the notable exception of the third dynasty pyramid uh, known as Zawit el Amwat. All of these pyramids, every one, is located on the western bank of the Nile. So there's no denial about that. Well, there is a lot of denial, but uh, uh, typically uh, they uh, these pyramids are grouped together uh, in what are called pyramid fields. So uh, there you have it, right? So let's, let's kind of go. So we're going to be going into evolution of the pyramids. So pyramids didn't just appear, you know, autochthonically, kind of nowhere, and suddenly they're building pyramids. We can trace the gradual evolution of pyramids over a period of time. Uh, so let's go all the way back, all the way back to the early dynastic period, which is uh, 3050 to 2686 BCE. That's 3050, right? <laughs> 2686 BCE. So we're kind of going back. Uh, quite a ways, you know, so, oh, just, oh, you know, about 5,000 years ago, right? <laughs> a little ways away, right? Um, um, and so, uh, and we're going to go through to the first part of the, the old kingdom a little bit, uh, where they built what are known as Masabas, or sorry, I should say Mastabas, Mastabas, Mastabas. Um, so what is a Mastaba? So it's spelled M A S. T-A-B-A-S, Mastaba. Well, Mastaba basically is a rectangular shaped structure. Uh, it has a flat roof and it has sloping sides on the exterior. And it is used for the sole purpose of burial. Now, they didn't call them Mastabas <laughs> in ancient Egypt. Uh, in fact, uh, the word Mastaba uh, is Arabic, and it means a bench of mud, <laughs> a bench of mud. So, so uh, because so many of them 
uh, were made out of mud bricks, although the later ones were made out of stone too. But uh, so when uh, the Arabs encountered uh, these mastabas, they just said, let's look like a bank of mud. They've obviously deteriorated over a period of time uh, when they're making this observation. But the ancient Egyptians didn't call them mastabas. They called them print digit. Uh, print digit basically means eternal house. It also could be translated as house of eternity. And so these were tombs. Now, the Egyptians, uh, they believe, like many other cultures around the world, uh, the soul needed to be richly fed. Uh, the soul, of course, a combination between ideas known as the ka uh, and the ba, you know, the, the, the ka, the, you know, it's like I'm gasping, uh, providing breath right and the bot which is the personality anyway so th th these need to be fed so these parts so uh so each mastaba uh, had a doorway that led to a chapel accommodating a place for various offerings of food and drink uh, to be either left uh, or a uh, burn to feed the soul to keep it alive to keep it strong so uh, it, it really was, in many cases, a false door within this chapel. Uh, the bodies were then typically located uh, below. Uh, in fact, uh, in a, a cavernous realm, a subterranean kind of chamber uh, that was sealed closed, so you can't have access to it. That's why there's a false wall there, right? Uh, and I uh, hear... Uh, within uh, this chamber, uh, they had a representation of the deceased uh, who was oftentimes hidden within the masonry uh, so uh, for its protection. So you have this, this so usually uh, there was this chamber uh, reserved for the body, and there's a second one that's reserved uh, for their stuff that go along with them in the afterlife. And this is other personal precious items uh, and, and maybe uh, wheat and uh, other kinds of food were stored there. Of course, a lot of beer, right? <laughs> so anyway, but the, the, the special chamber, uh, the burial chamber, uh, it's called uh, the Sir, Sir Dab. And the high up the walls of the Sir Dab were small openings, small little openings that uh, allowed the Ka and the Ba uh, to leave. Uh, the realm of the physical body and to go out. So, but it also allowed for these this aspect of the soul to return to the body because it is believed that the body uh, needed to be contained, uh, needed to be preserved uh, as a receptacle for the souls. Uh, in fact, uh, some of the ancient Egyptians believed that the Bon Pa had to return to the body or it would die. Uh, Again, these openings uh, were not meant to see the statue because, uh, once again, sometimes it's really heavy in the way with all the masonry. But uh, it is to allow the fragrance of the burning incense and uh, to be to be floating in uh, to this uh, this particular uh, burial chamber, as well as, of course, rituals uh, to be spoken to be heard uh, by the deceased. Or by their soul. But it's very fascinating. So, uh, in general, the the mastaba uh, were four times longer than their width. Uh, they could be as tall as thirty feet in height. Uh, sometimes, sometimes a little taller. And in direction, they're usually a, a north south orientation. And what are they used for? This is important. The focus upon it is not only for the preservation of the body, right? It is for the purpose of the resurrection of the body within the tomb. Got it? Resurrection of the body within the tomb. So, the, so you can see that this idea of the mastaba will eventually be transferred over uh, to the pyramids. And, and the primary reason is connected to burial. And you're going to see that. I'm going to give you all the evidence, and you'll see it for yourself. Okay. So by the time we get to the, uh, the, the first dynasty, right, the Mastaba uh, uh, 
started to get a little bit larger. Um, uh, so it, uh, in many ways, it simulated a house plan and several rooms and a, and a central one that contained the sarcophagus. Uh, there was abundant uh, funerary offerings. And of course, uh, what will happen is, is that it becomes just like a house of the dead, a house of the deceased. Now, typically of the second as well as the third dynasty, Mastabas uh, became known as the Stairway Mastaba, another development. Uh, so the tomb chamber then became deeper than it ever has before and was connected to the top with an inclined shaft and stairs. Eventually, a second and a third level were added to the Mastaba, and this process would gradually evolve into what is known as the Step Pyramid. But we're not there yet. So, when the pharaoh by the name of Oraha, they love that name, Oraha. <laughs> Oraha. Anyway, uh, the son of Narmer, who is oftentimes as uh, identified as means, right, the early unifier of, of, of Egypt, you know, you know, it was a means to an end. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, uh, anyway, when Pharaoh Oraha was buried within uh, a vast uh, complex of the Acropolis of Abydos, uh, many members of the royal household uh, had to be buried with him. This included servants, uh, many women. I don't know why, but they included dwarves, uh, even some dogs. It, it, see, it was believed that it was needed. Uh, their, their company was needed to accompany uh, them to their journey into the afterlife. Now, we are uncertain at this point whether these servants and, and selected dwarves uh, committed mass suicide or they were simply killed outright for the occasion of this ritual burial. Uh, Hor Aha's body was buried directly alongside young lions. Uh, which is, of course, the symbol of royalty. Well, so this became a tradition. It's an interesting tradition. And so, if, you know, the idea is that uh, when Harold got old and he died, those who were his staff, <laughs> I guess when they signed on, <laughs> they signed on not only for this life, <laughs> they signed on uh, for the next life. So uh, in life, in death, uh, they must have signed away uh, on, a, on a nice document there to agree to, in a sense, uh, have their soul carried to eternity uh, with, their, with their Pharaoh, whom they, they serve. So what will happen is, is that uh, there became a tradition. Uh, the tradition is, is that when Pharaoh dies, the staff gets to go with them. And I'm going to give you the exact tabulations right now. So when we go after um, uh, Hor Aha, we get uh, to uh, Didger. So Didger, uh, he was buried with 318 servants. Wow. Digit, who followed him, was buried with 174 servants that we know for a fact that were, they were sacrificed and then buried with him. After him was a pharaoh by the name of Ben, and the forensic evidence proves that the 136 men and women died all at the same time, and they were strangled to death, as we, we note uh, the, upon their, their necks, right, the bones being crunched in those areas. And yet, when we get to the time of uh, Ajib, he was buried with 64 attendants, ritually killed to attend him in the afterlife. You, you guys notice something about these numbers. You have 318, 174, 136, 64. Yeah, you're right. The numbers are going down. Uh, this is, I think people are starting to learn their lesson when, you know, Pharaoh starts to get sick. And they think he's going to go. They're thinking about transferring to another job. <laughs> so, you know, um, I, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm in for this whole life thing, after life thing. So um, we're going to look to work for somebody else. So the numbers are starting to go down. Yet it is clear that the numbers of servants ritually killed and buried with the Pharaoh 
as I said, we're deceased in number. And then what happens is as follows. With Semer Kirk, uh, who ruled around 2920 BCE, we find 67 additional tombs were built for his servants. But it looks like that these were built after he died. After he died. In some cases, many years later. Uh, so possibly what happened in this case is that, well, you know, Pharaoh dies, and they, as opposed to saying, you can go along, you know, go along with them and, you know, close the big door, boom, and then start panicking. What will happen is that you have another option. You can live out the rest of your life, and then when you die, then at that point, you can be buried with Pharaoh. And so that was the idea. But of course, there, there still was a few throwbacks. There's a few pharaohs where they went back to the old style. But in many cases, what they did is they replaced these servants with something else. And that's what's called the Ushabitus figure or the Shabbati funerary figure. And so these little figures, actually at first are large, uh, were intended to originally replace those who typically would attend Pharaoh to the afterlife and serve him in the afterlife. Now, as opposed to having them, uh, you're, they're going to be replaced by these, uh, these little statuettes. So the substitute. So what will happen is, what are these statuettes are supposed to do? Well, okay. So what these statuettes are supposed to do is as follows. Yeah, this is a real one. This is a shop with this figure. Like, oh, yay, hi. Uh, what these figures do. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, the word uh, Shabbati or Shabbatis means answerer. It means an answerer. And so uh, the idea is they're always ready to perform uh, whatever menial and manual tasks that are asked upon them uh, because they are simply answering to whatever Pharaoh wants in the afterlife. Uh, so I guess apparently when um, Pharaoh dies and you have the opening of the mouth uh, ceremony and you know his ha and ha are reunited, becoming the ak. What will happen is an essence possibly of that spirit uh, entered into these little figures and they, they come alive and they will answer you. <laughs> They'll answer Pharaoh, uh, become animated and move around. At first, <laughs> uh, these figures uh, had life-sized head. Uh, the heads made out of limestone, right? But eventually, uh, they became smaller in size, travel size. See, this one's travel size. Uh, and you can see that they're usually shaped like a mummy. I don't know whose mummy it would be. Not my mummy, but um, shaped like a mummy, often with a headdress, and sometimes carrying a basket on their backs or a hoe. Uh, you can see back here, uh, that um, there's there's nothing here, but somebody scratched whatever was written off of it, so it's been scratched off. You know, so it potentially scratched. So somebody just chiseled it away. So they are um, the figurines appear very early, as I mentioned before, but um, uh, the term itself is not applied until we get to the Middle Kingdom. And so the idea is, is that uh, they are empowered uh, to work uh, for the pharaoh, as well as others, eventually, other nobles uh, in the afterlife. They're going to do everything. They're going to clean your toiletries. <laughs> uh, they're going to uh, do your makeup. Uh, they're going to tend your farm because, you know, you know, you know they're, they're going to uh, weave your baskets. They're going to do everything for you. I, you know, I got to tell you, just between you and me, uh, this shop of this figure has not done anything for me. It hasn't cleaned my house. Look, I got a mess back there, uh, but it hasn't done any any work. So I don't know. Um, <laughs> maybe I can get a, a money back guarantee. Oh wait, no. I, I guess I have to be dead first, right? <laughs> yeah, that's a little much to ask. So I think I'll stop there. So, so what will happen is there, there's a few uh, texts that talk about this too. Uh, for example, the Chapatis is mentioned in the New Kingdom as the name, using the name, um, and I, in the Book of the Dead. And I'll read one part from it. It says, 
Uh, Shabbati figure, if the Osiris, place name of the deceased, be decreed to do any of the work which is to be done in Kurt Netter, let everything which standeth in the way be removed from him, whether it be to plow the fields, or to fill the channels with water, or to carry sand from the east to the west. The Shabbati figure replied, I will do it. Verily, I am here when thou callest. So, he, he hasn't said anything yet. So, um, I'm waiting. We'll see. He'll get an answer eventually. So, we move on to the next pharaoh. His name is Den. Uh, Den uh, uh, ruled around 2930 BCE, roughly. Uh, he was considered one of the greatest pharaohs of the early dynastic period. Uh, and is the first to be shown wearing the double crown, uh, one red and one white, representing Lower and Upper Egypt. And then was interred within a tomb that's known as Tomb T in the area of Abydos, which was, of course, associated with, with other first dynastic um, kings. Uh, uh, tomb T is amongst the largest and most finely built of the tombs in the area. And is the first. So Dens is the first to feature a staircase and a floor that's that's both made of granite. Uh, he was the first. Uh, his 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 tomb was the first tomb to have a flight of stairs leading up to it. Um, those of the earlier kings being filled directly above from the roofs. Right. Uh, it is possible the tomb may have been used as a storehouse beforehand. Uh, this tomb is uh, includes architectural elements made of stone rather than mud brick, so we do have a change of medium during this time. We took a we take a look at this, and there is of course a uh, there is um, um, uh, twenty labels that were found made of ivory and ebony were found in this tomb. Uh, tomb T, T is surrounded by burial sites of one hundred thirty six men and women, and women who are buried at the same time as the king. Now, it looks like uh, uh, for a short period of time, they kind of went back to the old uh, practice, uh, just, just for a short period of time that goes back again of human sacrifice because there is evidence of strangulation upon them. But then again, the shop of the figures will take over. Uh, again, they're larger at first, but then they get smaller. Then uh, it was really connected to a particular goddess. I, I, I just think this is interesting. I'll just bring it up. Her name uh, is Sishat, or also known as Sesat. Sesat, um, uh, images were set up uh, to her in different places, but around the tomb. Sesat was the ancient goddess, uh, the Egyptian goddess, believe it or not, of wisdom, of knowledge, and writing. With her name meaning, he who is the scribe. In fact, she was also oftentimes credited with inventing writing. That's right. Uh, she's really popular during the Old Kingdom. Uh, see, Shot is oftentimes shown as the official scribe of the Egyptian pantheon, uh, scribbling out various details, recording everything that's going on. Uh, in fact, uh, she was the goddess who recorded anything and everything needs to be written down. So she's the goddess of history and, and, and building and astronomy and surveying and, and architecture and mathematics and astrology and anything intellectual. Uh, she wrote it down. Uh, I love one of her names. She's known as the mistress of the house of books, with her priests overseeing the sacred archives and libraries of various kinds uh, dedicated to her. Uh, she saw it was always depicted as a woman in human form and sometimes portrayed with a seven-pointed emblem above her head. Now, we don't know exactly what that means, but, um, you know, and what she does is that she also uh, is shown to record the passage of time, and there's very, what will happen is, is that um, uh, you're going to see that she's holding a palm stem, and the palm stem is marked up with notches. And these notches, of course, represent the passage of time. And so the various pharaohs, this is why she's represented in tombs at this time, the various pharaohs know that their time is going to be up because she's the one who measures their reign. 
<laughs> so they worship her because they want to have a nice long reign because she decides their fate. Isn't that interesting? And yet we ever we hardly ever hear about her, but she's depicted in the earlier tombs. And I said earlier tombs um, because gradually she starts to get less and less as we move into the Middle Kingdom, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and so uh, that's just the reality. And so what will happen is patriarchy starts to move in and many of her, her, her jobs, her duties are transferred over uh, to the moon god Toth. And then all of a sudden, sometimes she either becomes Toth's wife or Toth's daughter. So again, it's clearly a change. But during this early period of time, uh, during the Old Kingdom, uh, she is the goddess of wisdom of the Egyptians. Okay, so we move on to the founder of the Second Dynasty of Egypt. Uh, his name is Hotep Sekmenwai, uh, or we, uh, who ruled uh, between 25 to 29 years, around 2750. The name means uh, two powers are reconciled, suggesting that there's two powers are being reconciled. It looks like there was some kind of conflict between Upper and Lower Egypt, and also between the god uh, Horus and Set. Upper Egypt is connected with Horus, and Lower Egypt connected with Set. So there you have it. Now, uh, what we'll see is that um, now we we'll see more images, of course, of Horus during this time. And then around uh, 2740, the second king of the second dynasty was named ra Neb. ra -Neb. And we know uh, from his honorary name uh, that um, uh, he is represented by the hieroglyph of the sun. So perhaps that's the raw aspect. Of course, the name can be translated two different ways. It could either mean Ra is my Lord, or it could mean, well, Lord of the Sun. But uh, we don't know the context. But if it does mean Ra, this is one of the earliest references to Ra. I know we think about the Egyptians, and it's Ra, Ra this, Ra, Ra that. <laughs> you know, what's all the Ra about? But the reality is, is that Ra was not at first the most important deity. That was Horus, and that was Seth or Set. And of course, some of the other ones that you know mentioned, but eventually he's going to rise. And that will mean that the sun cult will also start to rise. <laughs> and also rises, right? Why is that important? Because the sun cult will connect later on to the pyramids. So this is where ideas start to, to connect. So there you have it. So uh, moving right along, we still have to wait uh, until Dozer, uh, which we'll talk about soon, until the sun cult becomes really connected to Ra uh, in a more direct sense. And I think we probably need to get there pretty quick. So let's go there. King Dozer. I always, whenever I hear the word King Dozer, I think about this. So like he's falling asleep, you know. <laughs> Hi, I'm King Oh, man, he's King Dozer. <laughs> he just dozed off. Okay. Uh, King Dozer, uh, uh, he he ruled around 2686. Uh, he was the founder of the Third Dynasty. And importantly, uh, he was the pharaoh who established what is called the Old Kingdom, which stretched from 2686 to 2181. Okay. King Dozer uh, is the one Who's the next? Who's who really starts to establish the pyramid? And we're going to tell you exactly how that happened. What? Yeah, why not? Let's go here. So, what happened is is that those are uh, well. I shouldn't say that he's the one who did it. We just happen to know the name of the architect who made the first pyramid. His name is Imhotep, Imhotep, and um, he's the one who designed this. And uh, but at first, it was not intended to be a pyramid at all. But some reason, it did. So what happened is, is that uh, uh, they built a mastaba, 
<laughs> a big old huge mastaba. You know what mastaba is now, right? Has the sloping sides, the flat table lock top. But for some reason, in hope that decided to put a second mastaba on top of the first one. And then he decided to put a third one on top of the next one. And then he decided to put a fourth mastaba on top of that one. And a fifth mastaba on top of that one. On top of all the rest. Creating a stair step pyramid shape, but steps, step pyramid. So basically the first uh, pyramid, which is not the true pyramid shape yet, is basically one mastaba on top of another, on top of another, on top of another, on top of another. That's all it is. <laughs> step by step, I told you. Oh, bad joke. There you have it. Isn't that fascinating? See, we're watching the evolution. It's gradually we have a nice name. <laughs> you know, now the area directly below the step pyramid was a maze of corridors, uh, pretty amazing, um, with one shaft going down 28 meters uh, from the surface directly down to Dozer's tomb uh, that was sealed with this plug that weighed 3.5 tons. Of course, uh, such a uh, such a pyramid uh, was monumental, uh, and uh, it was made out of stone as opposed to mud brick. But apparently, a dozer had secured enough resources and, and human power to be able to put this all together. Now, let's talk about Inhotep, because we know a lot about this architect. And he becomes legendary. Uh, he was both supposedly the chancellor uh, to King Dozer, as well as the high priest of, yes, here we go, of Ra, who is the sun god of Heliopolis. Uh, beyond that, Hotep was one of the earliest known architects uh, and one of the earliest known engineers. Uh, now, the Egyptian historian by the name of Manetho, yes, uh, gave Imhotep the credit for the invention of the stone-dressed building. But of course, uh, you know, um, he really wasn't the first architect to do that, but he's given credit for it. Now, there are two inscriptions contemporary to Inhotep about Inhotep. So before we say this is something that happens way later on, you know, uh, it's revisionism, we do have inscriptions from that time connected to Inhotep. One was located on the pedestal of one of those statues, uh, and the other was actually some graffiti upon the enclosure wall surrounding Sekhermet's unfinished step pyramid, who is the next king after Dozer which means that uh, Inhotep kept living longer even after Dozer had died. Uh, so there you have it. Now, according uh, to the famous Egyptologist by the name of James Henry uh, Bristet, who lived from 1865 to 1935, Inhotep was portrayed as a priest uh, with a shaven head, seated and holding a papyrus roll. Occasionally, he was shown clothed in the archaic custom costume of the priest, uh, the details of his life, very little has survived, he says, through uh, though numerous statues and statues of him have been found. Some show him as an ordinary man who is dressed in plain attire. Others show him as a sage who is seated on a chair with a roll of papyrus on his knees or under his arms. Later, his statue would show him with a god-like beard standing and carrying the ankh and scepter. He is represented seated with a papyrus scroll across his knees, wearing a skull cap and a long linen kilt. He can interpret the papyrus as suggested in the source as, as no effect of the house of life. So he, he, in fact, later on, he can hope that he becomes divine. Yeah, he be believed to be a, a god of some kind to be able to do that. Uh, and sometimes, uh, or semi semi divine. Uh, one story says that he was the son of top, and sometimes uh, you know he was uh, this, uh, you know connected to other goddesses or goddesses as well. So uh, divine. So there you have it. Okay, in uh also became very important when it comes to Egyptian medicine. 
uh, claimed to be the author of various medical treatises. Uh, we have a surviving uh, text known as the Edward Smith Papyrus, which is attributed to Imhotep, and is very is very pragmatic in its focus. Uh, in fact, watch I mean, you go through it, and I'm really surprised because it's really it's medical uh, text uh, is not too much into magical cures. I'm really it's it's actually about more direct cures. Uh, the manuscript dates from 1700 BCE, so it is quite old, and it may go back way earlier, some scholars have said. And it goes into various medical treatments. 48 medical cases are described here, 27 uh, for head injuries, six for throat and neck injuries, two injuries to the, the clavicle. There's also, uh, you know, as much for injuries to the arms and the sternum and so forth, tumor, abscesses. Uh, a breast uh, uh, tumors as well. And so, so, yeah, so he's he's amazing. So there you have it, a very famous uh, architect. So he's not just well-known. I mean, he's known throughout the centuries, this great architect who is connected with the earliest pyramid. But what does the pyramid represent at the time of the old kingdom? Now, the answer to this question is one of gradual progression of meaning as time passes with different beliefs connected with these structures dependent upon who was viewing them at the time uh, from, from, from the archaeological evidence. The evolution appears to start with the Mastaba tombs uh, becoming more and more grandiose, and then a decision by Dozer to make his final resting place even more magnificent by placing a series of mastabas one on top of the other, thereby creating the step pyramid. We know that the shape of the pyramid came to represent the descending rays of the sun. But this concept would not be relevant with a step pyramid, but only with more of the true pyramid shape which, of course, when it's covered with this uh, highly reflective limestone. We know that the pyramids were believed to represent the primordial mound. Uh, we know, of course, that we from, and of course, from this primordial mound, the entire universe emerged. In fact, the pyramid texts from the late 5th dynasty and in the 6th dynasty elaborate upon this myth, the myth of the primordial mound. But the question must be asked if this is relevant going all the way back to the beginning of the third dynasty. We do not know if this belief goes that far back. We know that the shape of the pyramid came to represent the descending rays, as I said, but the but here we go. Uh, the rays, let's, let's, let's go into these, these theories. I'm going to jump into it. Let's, let's talk about this. So um, what will happen is this. The Egyptian sun god Ra, was considered the father of all the pharaohs. And he was said to have created himself from a pyramid-shaped mound of earth before creating all other gods. I'll, I'll say that one more time. The Egyptian sun god Ra, considered the father of all the pharaohs, was said to have created himself. He's creating himself from a pyramid-shaped mound of earth before he creates all the other gods. That seems to be important, right? So that's why we have this connection with the rays of Ra. Does that make sense, right? But what we can't be sure about at first, even before the extra layers of mythology and other interpretations are added to the pyramids, was the association with the dead. Yes, with the dead, with real tombs in them. <laughs> uh, and they were intentionally designed to house the remains, excuse me, the remains of the pharaohs and members of his household. That's so we know that much. In fact, and they were all constructed, as I said, from the on the west side of the Nile, which of course is associated with the realm of death and the afterlife. For it was the place of the setting sun. So, so what are they? Uh, well, well, maybe calling them resurrection machines, <laughs> maybe taking this a little bit too far. 
The evidence does seem to support that the very first Mastaba and then the pyramids were connected with resurrection from the very beginning. You saw that with the Mastabas. Furthermore, uh, many Egyptologists, uh, Merrick Lerner, for example, articulate that the, that the, that the ancient Egyptian word for pyramid translates as resurrection. Wait a minute, what? Wait, hey, stop, Dr. Riefeld, stop, stop, wait. You mean there's another word for a pyramid? Yeah. Oh, because you know, I, I talked to some people and they can't find the pyramid, you know, being used by the Egyptians. And so we think it's maybe they're formed by others. Well, you're looking for the wrong word. Pyramid is a shape. <laughs> it's a shape. It's a pyramid shape. And pyramidus, right? It is Greek. You know, so the Greeks later on look, hey, look at that. That's a, that's a shape of that's a pyramid. Okay, so we call the pyramid. Uh, there's also, you know, I always think to myself that the, the ancient Greeks, when they arrived, they're kind of looking around. Um, you know, we have them from sixth and fifth, fourth centuries. There, there was at the time a popular pastry called uh, a pyramidus. <laughs> it's a pyramid shape. So I'm wondering if they're looking at these pyramids and they're thinking, you know, looks like a giant pastry. But the point of the matter is, um, is that, um, yeah, um, I guess you want me to give you the word, don't you? I, you don't pull me back. There's another wordy English translation that is, uh, that they're called, basically, in the shadow of a long past, patiently awaiting the future. <laughs> but um, here it is. I'm going to go ahead and tell you. Mer. That's right. Mer. So using our lettering system, M-E-R, MER. That's what they're called, MERS. Ah, oh, there we go. So you can go around and correct everybody. <laughs> oh, pyramids, we've heard about them. We're going with the ancient MERS. <laughs> so wait, so if you're a lady that's attending an, an ancient pyramid, does that make you a mermaid? Okay, stopping. So <laughs> moving right along. So MER, it is. So not much is known. So now you're, you're getting too much information already. You're going, wow, all my questions are being answered right now. I know, isn't that great? Uh, now, not much is known about Dozer's successors, uh, but uh, uh, Semeket, uh, around 2650 BCE, he also left his own step pyramid at Saqqara. So the step pyramid things uh, seems to be uh, the new fact. You know, we're all, and you know, everybody wants to make their mastabas bigger than the others. That's just the way people are. You kind of wonder, it's almost like the mentality that you have with the New York skyline when it comes to skyscrapers. You know, it's like, we'll just make them taller and bigger. So, you know, the early ones, mastabas are small. And it's like the next pharaoh goes, well, I'll make my mastaba bigger. And it gets bigger and bigger. And then you think, oh, well, and of course, closer comes along, let's stack them up and make it even bigger. Look at me, I'm magnificent. You know, Freud would have a field day with this one. But then, of course, now, you know, now each one's kind of getting bigger, and we're just keeping in step with the times and stopping now. So uh, his pyramid, though, uh, Semeket's pyramid, was planned as a step pyramid from the beginning on, though. So at, while Dozer's pyramid was at first a mastaba, and then it built one on each on top, this time it's like we are intentionally making a step from the beginning. So it has less of the curvatures of Mustaba and it's more strictly based on the idea that this is a step, a, a stairway to heaven, so to speak. <laughs> there you have it, right? Uh, and um, But the pyramid was not completed. It would have had six or seven steps, uh, but, um, and um, it like uh, dozers, it was built of limestone bricks. But unfortunately, this pyramid remained unfinished possibly because of the Pharaoh's sudden death. And so only most of the first step had was finished and the rest uh, wasn't, but it was, a, but looking at the base, it was supposed to be bigger and taller and stronger, <laughs> but oh well. Now we can't identify, we can't identify the pyramid of the shadowy uh, Sonicop, but as for the next Pharaoh after him, Kaaba which is 2640 BCE. I'm going through each pharaoh at a time because 
I want you to know exactly, exactly how the pyramids come about. And you're knowing, and by doing this, you will learn how it evolves. And of course, the mythology evolving with it. So what happens here is uh, Kabak, the 2640 BC, he is connected with the unfinished layer pyramid, which is located about two kilometers of Giza uh, in a place known as Zawit Eras. And um, we, can, we can see from his Seric, his royal crest honoring the name of Pharaoh, right? Uh, that um, once again, you have, uh, uh, he's connected uh, to this, this, but uh, well, actually I should say, uh, he's connected to it uh, from these bowls uh, that were discovered nearby. And by association, they say that this is his. Some people say, well, it could be some other one, but who knows? And the next step in the evolution of the pyramid occurred under the pharaoh Huni. Here we go. Huni, 2610 BCE. Now we're entering into some era, very interesting uh, territory. Now he is associated accordingly, to the, to the very odd pyramid at Medum by some Egyptologists. Uh, and they're, they basically investigated this pyramid, and they have determined that it was originally a step pyramid. Uh, but, uh, in fact, uh, most of it was built before they decided to modify it to have, it, have even more steps above it, because they because Huni wanted his pyramid even taller. So this made the monument appear more, because the smaller steps made it look more pyramidical in shape. So as opposed to the big thick steps, now we're getting like little, little, little steps, right? And so it's looking more like a pyramid shape. After his, uh, his death, Huni seemed to have enjoyed a long-lasting mortuary cult. Uh, as we know. And then, of course, we move on to the next pharaoh. And his name is Sneferu. I always like talking about Sneferu. I always picture, this is this is me, I'm up there with Dozer sleeping. Sneferu, I always picture Sneferu having this real, you know, pharaonic, you know, emblem on the head dress, but, but the big, big nose, you know. My name is Sneferu. Anyway, let me see the cartoon character. All right. So, so Sneferu, uh, ascended to the throne, and he decided to cover the monument that was built by Huni with polished limestone blocks, and so create the very first true pyramid. Okay, so although some Egyptologists said that Sneferu built the entire uh, pyramid, so you got this this contest. So some people say that Huni, what he did is he made the step pyramid with lots of little steps to make it taller, you know, and then later on, Sneferu came and put the limestone blocks to make the true pyramid. But others say that, no, 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 uh, you know, Sneferu made the, the little steps and then he put the limestone blocks over it. Uh, and he did this all as part of the construction strategy. So there's kind of a, there's kind of a fight between the two, you know, so, but they're in camps. But either way, we have the Sneferu the true pyramid shape, exactly when that happens. And so that's 20, that's 2600 BCE, 2600 is when we finally get the true pyramid. Are you, but you know what happens? Oh, I got to tell you the story. Of course, he wants to, you know, some people say it's for him, some people say that, no, that's for, for hunting, whatever. But the point is, he tries to make a bigger pyramid. And so you have what is called the bent pyramid. Okay, so what turn, what, how it turns out is that, is that um, the bent pyramid is fascinating. So he builds this enormous pyramid and it rises from the desert at a 54 degree inclination. 54 degree inclination. But suddenly, it proceeds to a shallower angle of 43 degrees towards the very top, making the pyramid literally bent. So it goes like this, 
And then this somebody goes, what happened? What happened is that the engineers realized uh, that the angle was way too steep. <laughs> they messed it. <laughs> and so they quickly tried to fix it. Uh, and so this, this is not, so this is a work in progress. This is a, a failed pyramid. <laughs> it's bent. Uh, and so uh, there you have it. So once again, I want you to memorize that though. So it went from 54 degrees and then bends to 43 degrees, because you're going to hear about that again. Well, what will happen is, uh, let's talk about the Needham Pyramid. The Needham Pyramid, which we just talked about, that's, that's, that's controversial. Uh, what happened here is as follows. I mentioned to you the little steps, and then he put the limestone block. So why, why, did, why, didn't, why didn't he stick with that one? Because as it turned out, is that, uh, is that these limestone blocks that were facing this uh, the Medium Pyramid slid down. <laughs> Where those blocks lay to this day. Well, not all of them. I mean, because, you know, because people took a lot of it, but there's still the debris from it collapsing. You can see this. So it's like, oh, oh. So it's like the unveiling that fell apart. So that doesn't work either. So, uh, so, so, you know, first, you know, first time, or maybe the second time you get the bed pyramid, uh, the second time or the first time you get this little step pyramid and it slides down. By the way, he tries a third time and he's thinking, wait a second, Dr. Riefeld, Snefru is making three pyramids? Yeah. During his reign. Yeah. That's a lot of pyramids. I know. <laughs> He's trying to get it right. So third is the charm. Yay, Sneferu. Yes, thank you, Sneferu. So Sneferu, uh, he tries a third time. And that's called the Red Pyramid. And so what does he do? He makes the entire Red Pyramid 43 degrees. And the inclination. Ah, ha, ha. Because you know, he learned uh, from the earlier pyramid. Right, the early pyramid, of course, uh, was at a you know fifty-four degree. You know, I mean, sorry, it changed. So what happened is they changed the degrees, and it, there's a consistency there. And what happens as a result uh, is the red pyramid uh, still stands to this day. So with that, so now you have a true pyramid that stands. It's called the red pyramid, and it is huge. It is enormous. You know, so what happens is that. Um, in fact, it is the third largest pyramid in Egypt, a second only to the pyramids of Khufu and Khafra and Giza. So he learned the lessons of the Bet Pyramid with the upper section of the Bet Pyramid modified, right, to a 43 degree angle from a 54 degree angle on top. And so he, he learned that lesson and made it consistent all the way through. We take a look at this pyramid uh, and uh, it is it is enormous. I'm serious. It is It stands 105 meters or 344 feet high today. So it is, again, the third largest in Egypt. So when people are always arguing about the, uh, the, the you know, the largest one, the great the one uh, of, of Khufu, also known as Cheops, right? The great pyramid of Giza. They're going, oh, you know, how was he able to do that during his reign? Uh, look at Steferu. I got to tell you, he made three pyramids. <laughs> I'm sure his workers really love him, right? <laughs> okay. All right. So there you have it. So um, so let's get to, well, guess who's, guess who's coming up next? That's right. We get to Khufu. Yes, finally. Yes, the Great Pyramid of, of, of Egypt follows next. We're there. We got there. Uh, Khufu reigned from 2589 to 2566. These are all really approximate dates. People always fight over this, but um, considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world by the Hellenistic era. The Great Pyramid rises to a staggering uh, 146 uh, meters or 481 feet. So you think to yourself, okay, that's that's pretty high, right? So remember the Red Pyramid is 344 feet, and the and the Great Pyramid is 481 feet. Still a lot taller, but still, hey, you know, Kufu made three, so not Kufu, I mean, um, uh, different. 
So this was, as I said, was the tallest structure in the world for, well, you know, 3,800 years until we got the Lincoln Cathedral in England, which is third, around 1300s. But uh, the Great Pyramid required an unusual amount uh, of round-the-clock forced labor to build it in only 20 years. Um, now, the pyramid is estimated to weigh about 5.9 million tons, since there is about uh, 23 million blocks, 12 blocks weighing between 25 to 80 tons, would have to be placed into the structure every hour, day and night, for 20 years straight. I'll say it again. Uh, since there are 2.3 million blocks, 12 blocks weighing between 25 and 80 tons would have to be placed into the structure every hour, 12 blocks every hour, day and night, for 20 years. That's a lot of work. The entire pyramid is covered with smooth, was covered with, with a smooth white uh, limestone blocks. Uh, but unfortunately, way later, uh, in the 1300s, I mean, that's not too long ago, a massive earthquake loosened these blocks. So up until the 1300s, it had this, these beautiful blocks, uh, that white limestone blocks that covered it. And so it shined all the way through to the middle part of the Middle Ages, almost to the high Middle Ages. Oh, wow. But it, the th earthquake loosened it. And so as a result, Al Nasser Adin Al Hassan in 1356 decided to build various uh, structures in Cairo, including various mosques, using the limestone blocks that were part of the exterior of this uh, massive pyramid. Uh, in fact, uh, but, but uh, let's go on. Well, oh, I want to say something else. The pyramid, the pyramids in general, were not built by slave labor. I'll say it again. They were not built by slave labor. They were built by contracted workers. Slavery during the old kingdom wasn't that popular. That was something that was that happened elsewhere. That was much of the Middle East. So there was hardly any kind of form of slavery in Egypt. And most of that slavery, was foreigners bringing their slaves with them. I know, you have an aha moment. During the Middle Kingdom, also contracted workers. But during the New Kingdom, slaves built things. Why did that change? Because between the Middle Kingdom and the New Kingdom, you had the Hyksos, and the Hyksos introduced, during the second intermediate period, they introduced all these new ideas, you know, uh, obviously uh, uh, the use, uh, of course, of, of, you know, bronze and uh, chariots and old slaves. <laughs> so uh, that came in. So, of course, obviously the, 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 the believed uh, Jewish captivity was during the New Kingdom where it is believed that you know Jews were slaves. That's a new kingdom. But during the old kingdom, no, no slavery, contracted workers. And now I'm going to go into detail about them. Yes, here we go. Ready? Okay. So skilled, there's tens and thousands of these workers, and we have discovered their camps. And it's not like summer camp, but um, uh, and these camps were just were were unearthed near the pyramids by various archaeologists. In fact, uh, we know how they organized their labor. So the breakdown of this labor uh, was hierarchical, consisted of two gangs of 100,000 men each. 100,000 men each, two gangs. Each of these gangs were divided then into what are called Zahs, or phyli. So five Zahs of 20,000 men each. And then they're subdivided from there. Now, evidence uh, that we found shows that there were around 5,000 permanent workers on regular salaries uh, with, of course, the balance uh, working three or four month shifts in lieu of taxes. You know, So they don't want to pay taxes. <laughs> Be a contracted worker on the pyramids, yay, for three or four months. And you don't have to, or MERS, you don't have to work. So there you have it. Now, about around 4,000 
uh, were the total workforce of the laborers who quarried the stone. And they're the ones who hauled the blocks to the pyramid. And of course, obviously the setting of the blocks would involve others. But a lot of the workforce also involved support services, you know, tool makers and, and scribes and so forth, you know. So we have discovered uh, a papyri, actually various papyri written by the men who participated in the building of the Great Pyramid. Uh, uh, you know, and of course, this is the tomb uh, of, of Khufu, right? Uh, so amongst the papyri, they found a journal that uh, of an officer by the name of Merer. Uh, he, Merer, he led a crew of around 200 men. Uh, he traveled from one end of Egypt uh, to the other, uh, picking up and delivering goods of one kind or another. Of course, uh, one of the main things he did uh, is, of course, moving stone. And so Mayor uh, accounted for his uh, time and a half day increments, talked about filling his boat with stone, and then he talked about taking that stone up the Nile River to Giza. Mayor mentions that he reported to a certain noble by the name of Ankhoff, who, by the way, happened to be the half-brother of the pharaoh Khufu, and, of course, was understood as the overseer, right, overseer uh, of, the, um, of the construction of the um, pyramid. As somebody mentioned verbal tax. Yes. <laughs> Yes, you know, to work the Great Pyramid, you don't have to pay taxes for uh, three to four months out of the year. I think that's a great deal. What do you think? No? I mean, well, but they also get paid something. We'll talk about that pay in a little bit. Now, since the pharaohs used the uh, Tura limestone for the pyramid's outer casing, uh, Murr's journal chronicles the last known year of Khufu's reign and provides a snapshot uh, into the building of the Great Pyramid. Isn't that great? Is that sources? Of course, we also have graffiti, uh, but anyway, we'll talk about it later. Uh, now, what will happen is, is that um, uh, they found in the, in the 1980s, they found a residential area uh, for the pyramids, as well as Sphinx of the Giza region. And we take a look at this, and um, and in fact, then during the 19, around 1999, uh, they started to uncover the apartment blocks that housed as many as 20,000 people around these pyramids. In fact, uh, the, the settlement was as big as a football field. Uh, each of these structures was an ordinary uh, building that had a pillared porch and sleeping platforms and the kitchen. Isn't that nice? So you can, you know, three to four months out of the year, you get this little place, you get your own kitchen, right? Um, well, maybe. Uh, it was unfortunately enlarged to house around 50 people sleeping side to side. Can you imagine sleeping with 50 other people? <laughs> imagine the snoring, right? Uh, so these are basically barracks, right? And uh, and looks like that uh, the sleeping quarters were on two different levels, maybe different shifts. Uh, now, many of the Giza residents uh, like the uh, appear to have been very well fed. Um, because we went through their trash. It's kind of rude of us to do that. We went through the trash. And judging by the remains of the site, they were eating a, a, a great deal of beef. <laughs> uh, and, and looking at the bones, it wasn't just any beef. They left in the trash the choice cuts. So not only... <laughs> you know, I mean, sure, you, you know, you're 50 to a barrack. You know, I get that, you know. And, but the benefits are is that you don't have to pay taxes three to four months out of the year, and you can have as much beef as you want, apparently. Um, by the way, uh, they paid them uh, in, in even more than, than, just, than just beef. I just want to bring that up, too. So uh, they fed them, uh, they fed them uh, as, a, as, a, as a, they read, fed them bread. Uh, they, they fed them radishes. We find this in the documents, by the way, <laughs> and in the trash. Uh, we, we fed them onions, leeks, uh, and lots of beer. Can you imagine? You know, it's like, oh, and garlic. Lots of garlic. I love it. It's like, you know, uh, you know, you know, you had some onion, and you had some garlic. 
uh, and you had some radishes, uh, you had some beer. Hi, honey, I'm home. Ooh, ooh. You've been working on the pyramids again, honey? Ooh, ooh, get out. No wonder. Can you imagine eating that kind of food and then being stuffed with 50 men? Oh, man. Hopefully they had most bugs in those days. Okay, I'm stopping. So, well, you got to think this. You know, this is reality, right? Uh, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, burgers and brew doesn't sound half bad, somebody says. Veggies, too. Yeah, it doesn't. You know, offset all the meat. But it was a lot of beef. Uh, I mean, lots of beef. And uh, uh, so, uh, but uh, in fact, um, uh, well, as it turns out, we take a look. And, you know, the beef cattle was mostly raised in rural estates. Uh, and they were brought up uh, via uh, various boats uh, to Giza, where they were slaughtered there. Right now, now what happens is that interesting because we look at the the archaeology and looks at the, those people who raised the, the beef were not eating the beef; they're eating pigs. You know, so they're eating pork. But but the laborers of the pyramids are eating beef. Uh, and uh, in fact, um, uh, Lehrer, the archaeologist who I mentioned, mentions that the ratio of cattle to pig. For the entire site stands at six to one, so six uh, cattle, six beef to one pork, and for certain areas, as much as sixteen to one. So I mean, they and, 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 and very well stocked, and a lot of it. So basically, uh, you know, you know, you guys remember thinking because they're working so hard, uh, they need to have a lot of protein to be able to do that. There's a few other exotic things they found hippopotamus bones there and leopards but uh, teeth and so forth but for the most part it's a lot of beef also sailors were there sailors yeah and mirror mentions these sailors and other sources do and it mentions that that uh, in fact mirror's journal also mentioned that the stone was brought up right uh, to what is called the horizon of khufu the horizon of khufu which which many interpret that means the pyramid. So wait a second, what? Yes, and we have some other evidence, actually lots of evidence, to mention that apparently, well, not apparently, because uh, boats were buried too uh, near it, is that uh, that the Egyptians uh, created a, a canal uh, that redirected the Nile, or at least a part of it, to bring the stone right up to the pyramids of Giza, even though today it's a few miles away. So there appeared to be a major harbor that's connected to this area, this complex. Isn't that fascinating? So there you have it. <laughs> okay, so the Great Pyramid has three main inner chambers uh, called the Grand Gallery, the King's Chamber, and the Queen's Chamber. And I have everything written down, but I, you know, I think that many of you uh, uh, we can look that up. I want to make sure that we kind of get to where I want to go. Uh, the Queen's Chamber, of course, is it's, it's pretty pretty amazing. Uh, but uh, and of course, you have the Grand Gallery as well. Some of the areas seem to be hard to access, but uh, uh, they've been using a micro snake camera to kind of go around and, and poke around and peek around those areas, the ascending passages and the descending passages. But there's places that are blocked and so forth. Uh, the King's Chamber is kind of interesting, though. The King's Chamber uh, is, uh, there seems to be these shafts. Uh, and in fact, there are these shafts, but the reason for these shafts are not clear uh, because um, they don't need to have air shafts for any reason. And so they appear to be connected to the night sky, or they seem to be aligned to stars or areas of stars of the northern and southern skies. Now, you have something called recession. You have this, you know, so things, the star alignment is not exactly the same as it was, uh, I mean, as it is today. I mean, so the stars are different, you know, from ancient times. Uh, but it looks like that they opened up uh, to the North Star as well as to the Orion Belt. Uh, we know, of course, the North Star and these, these very stable stars were known as the imperishable stars. The indestructibles, they call them. And so, uh, in fact, there's one inscription that reads uh, from another place. It says, I, the king, will cross 
uh, to that side on which are the imperishable stars that I may be amongst them. So the idea or the belief is, is that these stars uh, connect uh, to the, the idea of living ever after, continue on. And so that's the concept uh, that uh, to bring the king spirit going up uh, into the heavens. So I find that very interesting. A lot of these uh, chambers are completely empty. Uh, the king's chamber has a sarcophagus that looks pretty unfinished. Uh, but they are, like I said, pretty empty uh, for the most part, long devoid of what they had before. We do know about Khufu. Let's talk about Khufu, who built this pyramid. And, uh, you know, I'm going to tell you, can I, I'm going to tell you a Khufu story. Why not? I mean, you know, oftentimes hear Khufu stories. They're a little different. <laughs> and then, uh, this story of Khufu, it, based from the Middle Kingdom, which is still not too far away from his time. Well, in Egyptian time, it is. And the story is narrated by his son and the next pharaoh, uh, Digit Fur. And he tells, uh, it tells his father, Khufu, about a miracle worker in the kingdom. I'm just going to go ahead and read the story because I think it's entertaining. And I just want to tell you a story. Um, once upon a time, once upon a time is my interpretation. There's a commoner named Dedi living in Digit Sneferu. He's a simple, I'm reading the actual piece. This is not, you know, you know, obviously not an Egyptian, but I'm reading the actual story. He's a simple citizen. But he is 110 years old, and he eats 500 loaves of bread, a shoulder of beef, and drinks 100 jars of beer every day. I got to tell you, that's a lot of beer. <laughs> so, you know, uh, and a shoulder of beef is quite a bit. Maybe you should join the pyramid builders. Uh, 500 loaves of bread, that's a lot of carbs, but he, he, he's 110 years old. He is capable, it says, of resurrecting decapitated beings. He is also said to be able to make wild lions so obedient that the animals would follow him with a cord dragging on the ground. Like a cat, right? You know, hey, let's, follow, let's follow the cord, right? Uh, furthermore, this Dedi has knowledge of the number Ipsat lit sanctuary of hope. Hearing his son's words, Kupu agrees that he should send for him so that he may be in his presence. So, uh, Digit Fur finds the elderly magician and tells him, your condition is equal to someone who lives from aging and to someone who sleeps until dawn, free of illness and wheezing. I, I like to be free of wheezing. For aging is the time of dying, the time of the preparing of the burial, and the time of being buried. This is the question about the condition of a noble man. I have come to summon you in order of my father, testified, that you may eat from the delicacies which my father gives, the food of his followers, and then he may guide you to the ancestors. It's nice. Which are the necropolis now. Then he replies, welcome, welcome, Digit Fur, son of the king, beloved of his father. May you be praised by your father, Khufu, the justified. May he let your place be at the front of all time honored ones. May thine Ka successfully champion all things against any enemy. May thine Ba know the ways that lead to the gateway of the mummified deceased. Now Dedi is brought before the Pharaoh of Khufu, who, is, who asked of him, it is true, though is it true, this talk about you could mend the severed head? <laughs> and Dedi responds, yes, O sovereign, my lord. May you live, be blessed, and prosperous. I know how to do that. Hmm, okay. But then Khufu orders, May a prisoner who is jailed be brought to me so that his execution may be enforced. In this order, Dedi is horrified and tells Pharaoh not to make a human suffer. Oh, sovereign, my lord, may you live, be blessed and prosperous. You see, it was never allowed to do something like that on the noble flock. Instead, then, of a human prisoner, Dedi chose to have three animals decapitated. Uh, a goose, a waterfowl, and a bull. After each was decapitated, this is not a story to tell a child, right? After each was decapitated, he would place the head on the eastern side of the hall and the body on the western side, say a set of magical words, and both the head on one side and the body on the other side would come to life. Oh, that's kind of weird. So the head would come to life on one side and the body on the other. After that, then he simply reunited the two 
and the animals would live again. After a few more tests of the magician's power, Khufu generously rewarded him, uh, and ordering, have Dedi assigned to a place within the palace by my son, Dedetur, where he shall live from now on. His daily uh, gainings will be 1,000 loaves of bread, 100 jars of beer, and 100 bundles of field garlic. 100 bundles of field garlic? Oh, man, that's a lot of garlic. <laughs> Hopefully it's like garlic bread and mix them together. Um, so, so there you have it. I did notice that, you know, before he ate 500 loaves of bread, so he got 500 or more. So maybe it's worth uh, becoming part of Pharaoh's household for that. Well, but you know what? I get the impression that Khufu doesn't seem to be a very nice guy. Are you are you getting that? You're getting that? That's important. Really? For this talk? Yeah, it is. So, so, because now we have a later account by the historian Herodotus, uh, the Greek historian, 484 to 425. And it shows that he is not a good guy. And he's known as Ramsinus, Ramsinatos. So he says, as long as Ramsinatos was king, as they told me, there was nothing but orderly rule in Egypt, and the land prospered greatly. But after him, Cheops him, became king over them and brought them to every kind of suffering. He closed all the temples. After this, he kept the priests from sacrificing and then forced all the Egyptians to work for him. Some, some were ordered to draw stones from the stone quarries in the Arabian mountains to the Nile, and others he forced to receive the stones, and it talks about him building the pyramids. So we have an account of the building of the pyramids uh, as written uh, by uh, the Greeks later on, who are talking to the Egyptians, and through their records, as well as oral tradition, have recorded these ideas. And once again, he is connected uh, to building these pyramids. I'll, I'll read another little part that Herodotus says. He says, uh, for this, they said, 10 years were spent and for the underground chambers to time of the pyramids on the hills upon which the pyramids stand, which he caused to be made in sepulchral chambers for himself in an island, having conducted thither a channel from the Nile. Look, we even have an account here of that channel I talked about coming from the Nile right to the pyramids. Then he talks about how the pyramids were made. He says, for the making of the pyramid itself, there passed a period of 20 years. We, we think now, you know, and the pyramid is square, each side measuring. It goes into the measurements, which are kind of off. This pyramid was made after the manner of steps, which are called rows, others called bases. When they had first, when they had first made it thus, uh, they raised the remaining stones with devices made of short pieces of timber lifting them first from the ground to the first stage of the steps. And when the stone got up to this, it was placed upon another machine standing on the first stage. So from this, it was brought to the second and so forth. So it talks about the machinery that's being used to make it. Uh, Herodotus mentions, because he visited Egypt, he was there. He said that on the pyramid, it is declared in Egyptian writing how much was spent on radishes and onions and leeks for the workmen. We've lost that graffiti uh, or that inscription today. And how, and also, if I remember correctly, what the interpreter said while reading the inscription to me, a sum of 1,600 silver, uh, silver talents was, was spent. So it talks about it. So it's common knowledge that he built this. And of course, also uh, Diodorus uh, from the first century BCE also claims that Khufu was hated by his own people as well. And it goes on uh, and forth, but um, and uh, but also we we find that uh, uh, that uh, it, it, you know, the workers on the Great Pyramid incised the exact dates onto the pyramid blocks uh, with an inscription that declared, "We did this with pride in the name of a great king, Kanu Kuf, which is the name Khufu." So we have we have you know we did it. So the pyramid, the Great Pyramid was built. There's a lot. There's more evidence too. I mean, graffiti, journals, uh, traditions, uh, archaeology, finding the workmen. Right. I mean, oh, we're going to go a little bit, a little bit longer. Not. I want to make sure we get through the section a little bit. So, how does one build a massive construction like a pyramid? One of the major problems faced uh, by early pyramid builders was the need to move huge quantities of stone. The 12th dynasty 
tomb uh, of Digit-Hotep has an illustration, uh, for example, of 172 men holding an alabaster statue of him on its ledge. Statue is estimated to weigh around 60 tons. Uh, and, um, and so it took about 45 workers to start moving this accordingly. Uh, so, so how is it done? So we know it's done. We have, we have illustrations, other images too, that show that they're using strategies and techniques. I just mentioned this one in the doom. So, well, there's one strategy. And if you know your physics, I'm going to bring it up right here. There's a method for rolling the stones using what's called a cradle-like machine that has been excavated in various new kingdom temples. So what happens is that uh, four of those objects could be fitted around a block, so it could be rolled quite easily. Experiments have been done using it, and guess what? It does work for 2.5 ton blocks. The question is, how do they move the 70 to 8 ton blocks? Well, there's other possibilities as well. So, but we do know there are some strategies, right? Moving further along. Now, one other little bit I want to bring up, as the stones uh, form the core of the pyramids were very roughly cut, especially in the Great Pyramid. The material used to fill in the gaps, that happened to be another problem. So huge quantities of gypsum and rubble were needed. Now, the problem is the filling has no binding properties. So they had to stabilize after they poured uh, the, the quantities of gypsum and rubble into these crevices. They had to be stabilized because it needs to have a stable core so it can stand. So to make the gypsum mortar, it had to be dehydrated by heating, which then required large quantities of wood. So they would stick wood in there and they would burn the wood. Wait, so you, wait, wood could be carbon dated. Wait a second, you mean you can date a pyramid? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but they can't date the stone, but you can date the carbon elements. Well, this seemed to be a big answer, but the problem is when they dated it, it turns out that the wood was older than the pyramid. Um, so they looked at this. In fact, the, the average age of the wood was 374 years earlier uh, than uh, the pyramid was built. It's like, what well, was it? So not thousands of years, <laughs> 374 years when it comes to the dating this carbon. Well, that's about 400 years. So they're thinking, you know, I mean, it would have taken to build, uh, to make this body agent all that wood. It would have been knock down all their forests. And sort of, well, how do they do this? So why is this wood off? Well, guess what? Well, many archaeologists went had an aha moment. They're all, wait a second. They're not, they're not tearing down, you know, not, the pyramid's not, you know, 400 years earlier. The wood is older. And the reason why the old wood, wood is older is that uh, basically, fair, this time, when people are building houses and homes and buildings and so forth, they're not using stone. In many cases, they're using wood. And so what happened is, is apparently uh, Pharaoh found an old, some old buildings and villages uh, that were to be torn down. And <laughs> he tore it all down and used the, uh, some of these old buildings uh, for kindling. So, you know, forests are too, are, are too much needed. This is interesting, right? So you can still date a pyramid. <laughs> by using these elements. Okay, so uh, there's also good information on the quarries uh, and how the tools they use to cut the stones in the quarries, the transportation of the stone, uh, and of course, how they did that. So workmen used uh, copper chisels, drills and saws to cut the softer stone, uh, especially most of the most limestone. Harder stones, like for example, we take them for granted, and it is granite. Um, as well as basalt, um, cannot be cut with copper, copper tools alone. So, so what happened is they used they, they used they pounded it down with dolerite and drilling and sawing with the, the aid of a of a pacer, uh, such as quartz sand. And then blocks were then moved through uh, 
by a sled that were lubricated by water. And of course, uh, that's how it moves. So, so there are, there's, the ancients were amazing engineers. But we find the evidence of how they made it behind. Okay, so let's get through a few a little bit more pharaohs. And uh, then I know there's a part you want to hear. Uh, and that's there's the, the Sphinx, right? Uh, so the pharaoh, Digitur, who's the next guy, the son of Khufu, who reigned about uh, 10 to 14 years around uh, 2575 BC, is connected with the ruined pyramid of Abu Rawash, which is positioned at a higher elevation than the three famous pyramids upon the Giza plain, making it the highest uh, uh, pyramid. Some scholars believe that this pyramid was actually a sun temple, but uh, the problem is, is that the pyramid itself is missing. <laughs> we lost the pyramid. We just have the understructure. So what happened? It was deliberately destroyed. We lost a pyramid, a whole pyramid. We didn't misplace it. It looks like the destruction started as early as the New Kingdom. So possibly uh, he's not a very popular pharaoh. <laughs> uh, and uh, some of that stone was then used by uh, some of uh, uh, the early Christians, uh, well, the, the four to five hundreds, to build various monasteries, like the Coptic monastery, for example, of Wadi Karen, uh, it's using some of those stones. Um, and then, in fact, there's still remains of it, even in the 19th century, uh, uh, still being hauled away with about uh, 300 camel loads a day. <laughs> Of, of stone. So they just took it away. So how they built this was interesting because what they did, uh, and I'll say this quickly, is they decided to build the entire tomb structure, dig it down first, build it up, and then what they did is plop the pyramid on top of it. So as opposed to, unlike uh, the Great Pyramid, where it's part of the of, the, of these various uh, ascending and descending passageways uh, going between the various chambers, the king's chamber, the queen's chamber, and when it's going underground. Uh, with this one, they got a little bit more clever and they just built everything underground and then they plop a pyramid on top and they block the entrances. And that was how, that's how they did it. That was easy, but unfortunately, they swept away the whole top. Oh, well. Pafra came, comes next, who reigned between uh, 2558 to 2532. He's credited for building the second large pyramid of Giza, which rises um, uh, about um, uh, you know 471 feet high. This pyramid still retains many of its outer casing stones. That's what makes it interesting. Uh, in fact, uh, it, co it covers the top third of the structure on top. You see the outer casing stones. And I think that's pretty exciting. Now, this is Khafra. Here we go, because you want me to go here. Many Egyptologists assign the famous Sphinx to the same time as the Khafra pyramid because of its close proximity and because many of the architectural elements of the Sphinx are similar to the surrounding complex built by Khafra, which includes, by the way, the Sphinx temple. Now, yes, the Sphinx looks differently from the pyramids. And people will say, well, you know, see, so it must be older. Well, no, there's a difference. You see, the pyramids are built with stone that was brought from somewhere else. But the Sphinx, much of it was carved out of the living bedrock. There it is, the living bedrock. And so, of course, it's carved right out of the living bedrock. It's going to look and older. It's going to be very porous, right? So there you have it. Um, now, of course, the makers gave it a, a man's head. Uh, some say it's a woman's head. The body of a lion. It is 66 feet high and 240 feet long. It has, um, it looks kind of, you know, it's, you know, so we take a look at this uh, and uh, look at the style and people fight about, you know, which is it connected to Kafra or does it go back to Khufu? And this is the argument that goes back and forth 
We're not going to go into the argument. Just know that there's an argument. But looking at it architecturally, uh, it seems pretty sure, uh, you know, what, the order of things that are built, uh, that um, it was part of Kafra's larger building complex. You know, so uh, there it is, right? So now apparently, so we do, there's, there's actually fossil fingerprints uh, on the blocks, uh, various of various places that uh, may have come from the ditch surrounding the Sphinx. What I find is interesting is that some of these blocks, uh, as they're building the Sphinx, there's a ditch around the Sphinx, and some of those stones that were connected to adding to the Sphinx were also included in the Sphinx. Uh, temple structure we know is built by Kafra, so you do have the temporary stones on both those monuments. So again, we're back uh, to a Kafra date uh, for it. It's interesting because uh, if you take a look at it, if you stand in the eastern niche during sunset, around March or the September equinoxes, right? Uh, you know, you, you you see a dramatic event. The sun appears to sink into the shoulder of the Sphinx and beyond that into the south side of the Pyramid of Kafra on the horizon. And so this may have been a very symbolic moment. But you see here a little bit of, of, of alignment going on here. Equally, uh, also the Sphinx during the summer solstice, the sun appears to set midway between the silhouette of the Pyramids of Kafra and Khufu, which is also rather interesting. So the architects seem to arrange uh, this complex, uh, Sphinx and, and Temple, to the sun. And of course, you have this growing cult of the sun that continues to grow. Uh, and maybe the idea is to collect this cosmic energy <laughs> from the sun to energize and give life uh, to the pharaohs. Uh, now, there are signs that the Sphinx was unfinished. In fact, uh, in 1978, in the in the corner of the statue's quarry, uh, they found um, well uh, three stone blocks that happened to be abandoned by the laborers uh, that who were happened to be dragging them to build the Sphinx Temple. We found that there, and the north edge of the ditch surrounding the Sphinx contains uh, segments of the bedrock that are only partially quarried, so they really didn't finish it. Here they found the remnants of the workman's lunch and a toolkit <laughs> and, and some beer and a water jar and stone uh, hammer. So apparently it's like, hey, you know, we're done working on that. <laughs> so look like the snake wasn't finished yet. It's like, we're done. <laughs> okay. And the remnants of that continues. And there's another story of the Sphinx. And it's connected to Kafra. And this is from the reign of Tutmos IV who's the son of Amun-Hat-Rotep. He ruled from 1401 to 1391. And it's called the on the dream stealing. And we have it. And I'll just read a part of it here. It says, and then we'll, we're going to wrap it up. So just more evidence uh, connected to who built <laughs> the Sphinx. And it says, now the statue of the very great Khafre, the great Sphinx, rested in this place. Great of fame, sacred of respect, the shade of Ra resting on him. Memphis and every city on its two sides came to him, their arms and adoration to his face, bearing great offerings for his God. One of these days, he happened that Prince Tutmos came traveling at the time of midday. He rested in the shadow of this great God. So he's resting in the shadow of the Sphinx. Sleep and dream took possession of him. At the moment, the sun was at zenith. Notice, by the way, from this, uh, this account from the New Kingdom, that, the, that the, the solar aspect is still very important at this time. Then he found the majesty of this noble god, so the Sphinx is going to talk, speaking from his own mouth like a father speaks to his son, saying, look at me, observe me, my son Tutmos. I am your father, Horamach Kepri. I shall give to you the kingdom upon the land for the living. Behold, my condition is like one in illness. What? All, all my limbs are being ruined. 
the sand of the desert upon which I used to be now confronts me. And it is in order to cause you to do what is in my heart that I have waited. And so in response, Tutmos says that he restored the Sphinx and because of his actions, the gods made him Pharaoh. Oh, water sources. <laughs> okay. So you look at the Sphinx, and uh, what happened is, what about the nose? You know the nose? What happened to that? Well, the nose, according to Arab historian Al Fizi, the nose was destroyed actually by a Sufi Muslim by the name of Saim Adir in the year 1378. So not Napoleon. Uh, when he discovered that peasants were making offerings to the image in their belief that it had the power to make for a better harvest. So this uh, Sufi is going, no, we're going to stop that, that, that worship of this image. Now, you know, so they're hoping that it would increase their harvest. Now, you're going, this particular man did this. However, I want you to hear the rest of the account. Saim al-Dir was so enraged that he destroyed the nose. Uh, and so as a result, uh, had to pay the ultimate action for penalty for his actions. He was hanged for vandalism. Okay, so that's what he gets. Now, of course, uh, we have another one, which we won't talk too much about, because I want to wrap this up and see what happened to the pyramids. So ruling from two, 2532 to 2112, we have, of course, uh, Pharaoh Merenkur, the son of Kathra, the grandson of Khufu. According to Herodotus, unlike many of his predecessors, Menachar was fair, considered a good pharaoh. And I do want to do want to read this. this. This is interesting. He said, this prince disapproved of the conduct of his father, reopened the temples, because even his father was considered bad, um, reopened the temple and allowed all the people who were ground down to the lowest point of misery you know, was working on these pyramids, supposedly, to return to their occupations and to reserve, resume the practice of sacrifice. His justice in the decision of causes was beyond that of all the former kings. The Egyptians praised him in this respect more highly than any other monarchs, declaring that he not only gave his judgments with fairness, but also when anyone is dissatisfied with the sentence, made compensation to him out of his own purse and thus pacified his anger. That despite his fairness, the goddess, according to Herodotus, deemed that the Egyptians were to suffer with harsh rulers for the next 100 years. An oracle reached him from the town of Buto, which said, Six years only shalt thou live upon the earth, and in the seventh thou shalt end thy days. Well, he was upset, and so he sent an angry message to the oracle, reproaching the god. Uh, with his injustice, he says, my father and uncle, he said, though they shut up the temples, took no thought of the gods and destroyed multitudes of men, nevertheless enjoyed a long life. I, who am a pious, and I am to die soon? There came a reply, a second message from the oracle. He says, for this very reason is thy life brought to quickly an end. Thou hast not done it as behoove thee. Egypt was fated to suffer affliction 150 years. The new kings who preceded thee upon the throne understood this. Thou has not understood it. And so what did he do about it? He's now doomed, you know, because he's good. Because <laughs> he made the smallest pyramid. He's kind of modest. Because he's good, uh, he's only to reign six, six, you know, you know, six years. And and Egypt is fated to have bad rulers like the ones who built the two biggest pyramids. I mean, come on, you know. So what does he do? He reigns 12 years. Why? What does he do? How does he reign 12 years? He says, well, what happens is this. He made, uh, he did, supposedly, uh, to make it six more years, is he had lambs prepared, which he lighted every day at evening, evening time, and feasted and enjoyed himself unceasingly both day and night, moving about in the marsh country and the woods, and visiting all the places he heard were agreeable soldiers. He wished, so basically, he just kept it light all night around him, so that way, by turning nights to days, he could live twice the life. So he reigned 12 years. So there it is. And you have, of course, his pyramid is a lot smaller. It's only 215 feet. What happened to that pyramid? Well, uh, the, uh, uh, the second Ayyubid, a sultan of Egypt, Al-Malik, decided to tear it down. 
uh, during his reign from 1171 to 1198. He started, but fortunately, it proved to be too difficult for him to do it and just left a big gash on the side, but it was just too much work. Now, the fate. After this, uh, you're going to have another one by Shepsutkoff, but you're going to start to see gradually, as time goes on, the pyramid becomes just an architectural aspect of a larger mortuary complex. As a result of that, the pyramids start to become smaller and smaller. In fact, <laughs> soon after, for a quick period of time, they even went back to the step pyramid. What's going on? Because the mortuary cult, the mortuary temples become more, more interesting to them. The pyramids lose its allure. Then what happens is that we get to the Middle Kingdom. We do have pyramids during the Middle Pyramid. We do. But they hardly exist. Because what happens is this. Where before, during the Old Kingdom, you know, they, they, they had a solid stone core and they, they fixed it. You know, I talked about how that works and placed the limestone blocks and really solid. Well, they kept the idea of the limestone blocks, but much of the center of these Middle Kingdom pyramids were rubbish and mud. And, you know, so, so as long as the limestone exterior remained, the pyramid looks pretty good. But as soon as any of the limestone blocks broke away, the weather and the rain and everything else just eroded, melted these pyramids into nothing. So you had, in a sense, a cheap, <laughs> cheaply covered pyramids <laughs> with a mud core, uh, with a rubbish core. And I don't know, I could, I could think of all these illustrations I could give about what that means uh, <laughs> uh, symbolically, but it's definitely a decline. The pyramid shape is still considered sacred, but uh, in many cases, even without a grand pyramid, you're going to see its symbolism will be incorporated in other ways and in smaller form in these mortuary temples. And then by the time you get to the New Kingdom, you know, it's passe, and that ends the pyramid. So, you know what? I think you know too much now. You're dangerous. <laughs> so we know a lot about the pyramids. Uh, there's a lot of details I could tell you, but uh, I wanted to. Uh, Keep it at least, um, I you know, I have 10 more, I have 10, 15 more pages of materials. But I want to make sure that you can just digest it all. There's so much to go, but you can tell me now, on a reasonable doubt, how the pyramids evolved and why they evolved. So it appears to me that at, st at first is about resurrection machines. They are about uh, resurrecting the dead, that being the pharaohs, right? And then as time goes on, it takes on solar aspects and connected to raw, the primordial mound, uh, as well as the rays of the sun. That idea does continue uh, throughout the time of the Giza pyramids, and especially after that. And it seemed to be connected to the rise of Ra as an important deity, right? But uh, again, Times change, uh, pyramids kind of go out of fashion, the big ones, they're labor intensive. And sometimes these pharaohs rather have this elaborate mortuary complex rather than just one big pyramid uh, at the very end as like this enormous tombstone. And so that is the story of the pyramids. <laughs> I hope I didn't ruin them for you, uh, but they seem to be very much connected uh, to the human condition, they're connected to, yes, the worship of the gods. They are connected to the idea of wanting to live forever. But they're also connected to the idea of power and prestige and control. Thank you very much.
All right. So there you have it. So we cover a lot. Do you feel like you could tell me how a pyramid was made, right? Yeah. I mean, it wasn't yourself. ancient aliens. So it wasn't ancient aliens. And in fact, uh, over and over again, the evidence shows that it's just Egyptians. <laughs> I know, I know. I, I feel bad, you know. You know, hey, maybe in Hotep, you know, maybe he's an alien, right? <laughs> There you, know, you go. There you go. You know, there you go. Okay. I'll go with that. But um, yeah, um, you know, the, the interesting part, I always love uh, Sniferu, you know, because everybody's going, oh, they couldn't make a pyramid, you know, in that short period of time. And Sniferu makes three of them. <laughs> That's all trial and error. It's like, oh, that doesn't work. Let's do it again. <laughs> it doesn't give up, you know. I tell you, notes of the grindstone. It's big nose, right? I always picture again Sniferu. Or he has perpetually a cold. I don't know. But uh, anyway, like I said, I like to make a cartoon of him. You know, just like, you know. The... So, any questions? Well, I'm thinking about the extra manpower that it must have taken yeah. to dedicate that much workforce to something that is just a monument. They weren't, you know, right. making housing or growing food or any of the other productive things, they were just making this cool thing that the Pharaoh wanted. Well, yeah, because, because there's nothing else to do. So here we go. <laughs> okay, so, so yes, if you're living in Mesopotamia, life was really tough. You know, I mean, you know, uh, you had floods, you got droughts, you know, they're busy doing, you know, irrigation, you know, many irrigation to bring the water to uh, uh, to the fields, they're coming up with you know crop rotation and you know fertilizing the fields, you know using sheep and you know all that kind of. They're, they're thinking all these great ideas. In Egypt, it was like this. Uh, you know, so so starting August into September, you had of course the Upper Nile. You have all this black rich silk, and it washes up and goes up the Nile, or I should say go down, go, goes down the Nile. And what it does is it just covers, the water rises, the flood water rises, and it covers the Nile basin with this fresh, rich mud. Very, and then in November, it recedes. And so the farmers just plant, renewed. And so the Egyptians, even though they're busy, a lot of them are not as busy at doing farming because they have this automatic system going on for them. <laughs> it's like sitting back, da -da 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 there is the water, da -da 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 there's the fresh soil, let's plant, <sighs> let's wait. Oh, that's great. And the next year, Da, 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 da. So there's a lot of extra time. You know, there's an old saying, idle hands are tools of the devil. <laughs> so, so yes, for about three to four months out of the year, <laughs> you, you got to keep these people busy. <laughs> so, yeah, why not? <laughs> so you did have, you did have some, a little extra, a little extra time. Hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not like Mesopotamia where they're just, <laughs> you know, struggling to survive, you know? This is Egypt. This is why they talk about the fat of Egypt. This is why they talk about, you know, you know, they have stories of the Israelites. It's like, hey, let's go back to leeks and onions and melons. We want to go back because, you know, it has all the great food. And people aren't starving. That, you take a look at those camps <laughs> where they're building the pyramids. That's not starving rations. That is the best of the best. So they're eating well. They're being so lots of benefits, you know, no taxes and lots of food. So I don't know. Yeah, that makes sense. So Egypt is, a, is kind of a weirdo uh, when it comes to the rest of, ancient, of the ancient world. <laughs> it's, a, it's a strange bird because, you know, uh, they actually love their gods too. That's why I think it's interesting. You know, the Mesopotamians are like, oh, hey, <laughs> it's like, just kill us already. And, and, you know, their afterlife is just like, oh, I get to squeak like a bat and disappear. 
may I just, you know, I just don't want to exist at all. Meanwhile, the Egyptians are kind of going, you know, life's so good. I can't just kind of keep on and keep living. <laughs> Let's just keep the story going there, you know, you know, and their lifespans are longer. Sure, it's shorter than in modern times, but it's a lot longer than it is in other places. And so they conceive this idea of living forever because they're living their life now at that time well enough to imagine that the afterlife must be also pleasant. Does that make sense? It's like, oh, in ancient Egypt, Mesopotamia, it's like, you know, you're living to be, you know, you know, 20 years old and you're going to be dropping head soon, you know? <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, but you, know you, do, you do take your, you know, uh, monthly or yearly bath, so that's cool if it ever rains. The point is, is that Mesopotamia, in Egypt, however, it's like you bathe every day. <laughs> You know, you know, so it's kind of clean. So, so, so maybe I should, you know, retract what I said about the fifty men all sleeping together. Hopefully, they all washed. I'm sure after the labors, but it still doesn't, you know, excuse them from all the, the onion leak breath. But uh, you know, is this good? Is this making sense? So there's a context there. Um, but uh, yeah, and um, but yeah, they love their gods. They have the nice, you know, sure some of the gods they they are scared of, but a lot of them have these beautiful attributes, like you know. Humble one, helping the lame, helping the travelers. That's Amon Ra. You know, it's like, wow, really? <laughs> so, yeah. Did I answer that question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. 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 So, so, there was, and, and, and it, it, look, look at Egypt. There's, and so, they didn't need slave labor. They got off season workers. Slave labor comes later. Okay. Much later, you know, like I said, they did allow slavery. If you came into Egypt and you had a slave with you, they did allow that. But slave labor did not become popularized until the Semitic Hyksus arrived during the second intermediate period. Now, which is interesting because they enslaved the native Egyptians. And then when Othmos I ran them out to start the new kingdom, they just returned the, um, the pleasure. <laughs> he said, well, you enslaved us, so <laughs> we're going to enslave you. And their allies were the Haberi, the Semitic Hicksus, which are the Hebrews. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, there you have it. Interesting. Yes. yes. Any other questions? No? No? I guess you covered it all. Did I cover it all? You know? Nothing at all, right? So all the questions are answered. Are you are you, are you surprised? Um, the, all the, how the Hyksos connected to the Hebrews actually did the whole talk of that. The Hyksos are Semitic peoples, and they come from uh, the area of Canaan, and they they moved down and they attack the uh, attack the Egyptians, and that ends the Middle Kingdom period, and so you have this hundred years of foreign rule, where they bring with them, as I said, chariots and the use of, uh, of bronze and so forth, these new technologies, and they believe also bring with them slavery. Uh, we do find that the, that the group known as the Haburu, Ethmaru, uh, appear uh, mentioned in Egypt during the New Kingdom. They weren't mentioned before in Egypt during the Old Kingdom, or the Middle Kingdom, but after that they're mentioned, uh, and they are slaves. So there's an association, but we also connect the he uh, Haburu as Hebrew, you can see the, the sounds, because we can also trace uh, their uh, their background through um, the, name, the name Haburu, this is another long story, uh, is, is originally associated with the area of Mesopotamia, and it first appears around 1800 BCE, which, by the way, is around the time of Abraham. And then, then this term Haburu moves up uh, to eastern Anatolia, and then we find tons of information about the Haburu by name in, in the area where Israel is, and Palestine is. Isn't that fascinating? We find it there, and then all of a sudden, that name uh, is there, and then after the Hyksus, it also appears in Egypt. But unlike a biblical account, it's in both places still. So that means there are Habru who stayed behind and Habru who are in Egypt. And then what happens is that at uh, during the time of the Sea People, during the 1200s, 
Ahaburu, they disappear from Egypt in the inscriptions, and they appear uh, in a larger amounts in settlements with their pottery to the Delta region that we found, suddenly appearing uh, in pits in places that I've seen at Tel Dan and other locations in Israel. So it looks like then they moved back uh, to the area of Israel and Palestine. Is this, is this interesting? I don't know. Yeah, that's fun, right? So yeah, that's how we know. Answer the question. Right. Yeah, I just posted the link to the uh, to the lecture on the, the YouTube. Yeah, I think I'll have two room. hours on this. Yeah. <laughs> so I summarized that in a, in, a, in a five minutes that I do for two hours if you're interested in watching that. So yeah, is this fun? Any other questions, right? Yeah, right. So no questions as, oh, okay. So, oh, so now we're going to, um, oh, we're going to that, that, those topics. So let's see here. As far as the name Moses is what is fine. I can't help but think that some of the names, that's not Moses. Yeah, Moses uh, to draw from, right? Uh, Moses is a typical uh, Egyptian name. It's not a Jewish name. Well, I mean, it's a Jewish name, but uh, yeah, that Moses is the same. But then again, he's part of Pharaoh's household, you know, according to belief. See, I'm adding that, according to belief. Right? Uh, he's part of Pharaoh's. So, so that's that connection there, too. So any any questions on pyramids? You know, you know, do, do, you're not going to introduce you to the pyramid schemes, you know? So, I oh, wonder if the uh, architecture was worse during the slavery period. Be shoddy architecture? Mm. You, you know, was it worse during the slave period? Yeah, because they didn't take as much pride in their work or, you know, they're like, Forget this. We're gonna do a shoddy job. Well, yeah. I mean, it looks like they did, a, but it looks like they did an okay job on those on those New Kingdom buildings. So I guess the, the quality was up, but you know, but maybe not done with love and care and tax free situations. You know, more uh, hardship. And there, and we know that slaves didn't eat as well either, because again, people always forget this. And I wonder why. You know, everybody goes number two. <laughs> and everybody goes number two in different places. So it's not like we don't have what we left behind. <laughs> so we know what they ate. We take a look. We know the fiber they ate. We know the foods they ate. And we know if they have were good nutrition. And we know if they're bad nutrition. And we find a lot of little worms and terrible things in the intestines. And it's bad. So it's, it's bad. But that was, you know, it, during the time of the New Kingdom, and so slaves didn't eat as well, right? So we know they weren't they weren't treated very well, or not, you know. But during the during the the, the old kingdom, of course, were treated well, right? They're they're not slaves; <laughs> they got the best of the beef, you know. So uh, at least at least so you know, you know, Osiris tells me, right, right, Osiris, <laughs> right, hi, that's Osiris, hi. Hey, Cyrus. <laughs> Let's see his monk there. Yeah, he's looking at you. He's just looking at you, kid. <laughs> and then you see old Cyrus. Okay, I'm moving right along. <laughs> <laughs> of course, there's always Hathor. Oop, oh, <laughs> all right. So we're moving right along. <laughs> so any other questions? You're like, okay, there is a question in the chat. Yeah, okay, yes. That was the question. Uh, I think I heard a theory that Tutmos was Moses before he left Egypt on on the run after killing an Egyptian. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I yeah, I, I actually have heard that theory, but it just doesn't. The, the Egyptians left so much in the way of records. I know that you're thinking, well, yeah, you have it on the stone. Well, Egypt has this great climate that preserves. Um, a parchment. So uh, we got we got records. <laughs> you know, if it was anywhere else, then yeah. But uh, Egypt, it's like it's a place that remembers. <laughs> you write something down. Uh, Egypt has this way. I mean, we don't have a lot of records from that time. We, we do have some though. Uh, we have a whole bunch during the Kanaanatum. A whole bunch of stuff. But uh, yeah, hope that makes sense. So we do have records. It doesn't seem to work out with with the timeline at all, but um, but yeah, I've heard that too. You know, I mean, and there, it's a name. You know, if he's supposedly connected to Pharaoh's household, he would have a good Egyptian name like like that most. So he's shorted to Moses, right? <laughs> Maybe it's his nickname. Right? 
Okay, any other questions? Any other questions? Oh, all right. Well, I guess I'll walk like an Egyptian out of here. Uh, <laughs> I got one more. Oh, you do? One more. So do you think that the contract workers were conscripted, like force conscripted to do it? Or was it considered an honor or did they want to do it because of all the good food or, or did you have to do like, you know, eight years of three month service or something like that? Well, considering the fact that they get a tax break on it, I, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a sense of volunteerism going on there. Right. And like I said, you got to imagine here yourself. I mean, you're looking at what they left again behind. They are feeding these people really well. They are working hard. They are working really hard. They're feeding them very well. They're giving them any any food they want. They have all the perks. But yeah, I can see maybe you're not happy about living with 50 other people. <laughs> but you said I, things weren't bad at home. But things were too. But I, but yeah. So I'm not, I'm not sure if I like the room and board. But then again, a lot of people don't spend a lot of these times indoors anyway, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we know they, they, were, they were nice and clean. They washed themselves. So we know that, they, you know, so... I don't know. I mean, they worked all day, slept all night, but they saved Drank money. all night. Yeah, yeah. So I hope that helps, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I, Ali says the star alignment of the pyramid would seem to be uh, something that we can use for dating, using procession of equinoxes potentially. Thank you, Ali. Yes, absolutely. And they do line up if we do the procession correctly. Yeah, yeah. I had to use that for my... Um, my, my book on Artemis of the Ephesians, too. Uh, that way, you know, I had to calculate the recession and the, the stars would line up at certain temple sites and places where it's like, look, the te it doesn't line up at all. It's like, yeah, but now let's calculate. <laughs> you know, in the first century, it's like, oh, that's the same thing. You know, people say, oh, you know, these air events, they don't line up to our stars. It's like you have to account for them at the constellations. It's a little different. And then you can, it does measure up. So definitely, yeah. so definitely something I would like to learn more about. Yeah. So it is definitely important to learn. Is this good? You guys learn anything here? Right. So, oh, wonderful. Oh, okay. Do you believe any theories that pyramids um, enhance or store energy, psychic abilities, ESP, sharpened blades kept inside them, curses, et cetera, et cetera? You know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have fun with this. Uh, what I mean by having fun with it uh, is that um, I believe that maybe the Egyptians believe that. For an extent. How's that? In the, in the safe religion scholar answer, is it not? <laughs> there seems to be evidence that the Egyptians themselves believe that they possibly could store some power and some energy. Uh, and... Um, you kind of see that with the pyramid texts. So the pyramid texts, it's store to go there, but you also kind of see that with the alignment of other things as well. I, I hope that helps, right? So, uh, because it does seem to be all about uh, energy from the sun that is connected to the, the configuration of these, of these pyramids that seem to be aligned. I mean, the Great Pyramid is perfectly aligned north, south, east, and west. I mean, it's, it's pretty pretty obvious. And the outline does seem to fit the star alignments, although not exactly. So, uh, but yeah, the Egyptians, you guys ever heard of the, uh, you guys ever heard of the, the cannibal texts? <laughs> I shouldn't even go here. Yeah, so, so, so so, so the Egyptians believed that that the gods can feed you themselves, so you keep on living forever. <laughs> or it comes to the pharaohs. <laughs> I know I got your attention. Uh, so, uh, so basically, what we see here, I actually have something on it, is is that uh, based, there there, is, there are these um, uh, these. Uh, cannibal texts where the the pharaoh he will actually hunt the gods he will lasso them <laughs> he will bind them he will then slaughter them and then he will eat their entrails especially their hearts because it contains intelligence 
uh, in order to gain their powers, to gain their energy. So this is symbolic cannibalism. Yeah, so uh, there you have it. Um, these are called cannibal hymns. Uh, and these are in the pyramid texts. <laughs> the pyramid texts uh, of Unis, for example. Uh, in fact, I'll read. I actually found, as I'm talking, I actually found a quote from that, because, you know, that's me. And, and there it goes. Um, this is Unis says, the cannibal hymns connected to the, to the pyramid texts. A God who lives on his fathers, who feeds on his mothers. Unis is the bowl of heaven who rages in his heart, who lives on the being of every God who eats their entrails when they come, their bodies full of magic from the Isle of Flame. So I think I answered your question. <laughs> Probably more directly than you wanted me to. <laughs> so yes, they, they do believe this, this energy uh, from, from the gods feeds them and is connected to uh, immortality and resurrection. So, yeah, the, again, these are the pyramid texts. So, uh, you know, and, you know, hieroglyphics, but also, uh, yeah, all aspects written. Yes. Uh, any other question? Yes. Great. I, I, yeah. You, you can read it. Yeah, so, so I'm reading what you're writing here. Uh, are, are, are these, these are hieroglyphics? Yes, hieroglyphics. Uh, uh, yeah, the cannibal thing I didn't know at all. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah, so I hope that helped make sense. Yeah, so no giant magnifying lenses found near the pyramids that have, could have been used to melt the stones into place. No, uh, instead we have found the kindling in the pyramids themselves as a binding agent, which I think is really cool. <laughs> so, yeah, so, which we can use the date, carbon dating. So when somebody says you can't carbon date the pyramids because they're uh, they're made out of stone, it's like, well, guess what? <laughs> and and I told you about the you know the, the almost four hundred years to, you know years difference, but again, I talked about how that worked. But none of this a thousand years earlier, two thousand years earlier, it's common knowledge that these as you see this that these pharaohs, at least the big ones made these pyramids <laughs> and they retained that all the way through the middle kingdom into the new kingdom all the way to the greek period of time uh through oral transit uh, transmission but also through uh inscriptions in stone they literally wrote down the fact that they built them <laughs> the laborers we built this for this guy it's like huh i wonder if this was built for this pharaoh they're leaving a note saying they built it. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, is this again helpful? I know. I would have root pyramids for you guys. It's still fun. You know, like I said, it's it's not the pyramid scheme that you would would would, uh, would think it would, would be. But um, or maybe it actually it would be a pyramid scheme because everybody's working for anyway. They're working for each other. Okay, so think about it. Maybe the pyramid scheme is a pyramid scheme. And guess what? You don't have to pay taxes. That's <laughs> part of the benefits. <laughs> oh yeah, it's like so. So, well, the next time around, uh, you know, have other people work for you and place them as you move up the rotation, right? Does that make sense? It's like okay, so hey, I worked last year on the pyramids. Now I'm moving up to management, but you now it's your turn to work as a laborer for three to four months, and then you get to move up. You know, so yeah, maybe this group. Okay. Any other questions? I know I'm getting silly. Uh, I didn't sing. I didn't sing because I don't know enough of the lyrics. Walk like an Egyptian. That's all I can say. And then you know, that's all. So I can't do that. So, are we okay? No singing. No singing. No singing. No singing. Okay. I've got to run. Great job tonight. Thank you. Did you guys, did you have fun tonight? Yes. Okay. Good. Glad you had fun. <laughs> Great. Glad you had fun. Now I got to run. <laughs> <laughs>